So um, yes, I'm going to discuss uh, some of the fundamentals of, of mixing, solute mixing in porous media. Uh, I don't know if you see very well here. This is um, a, a, an experiment I'm going to use a lot during that, that talk to uh, basically illustrate uh, what we know about mixing in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this environment. Um, that was done by Joris Eman, who has a poster over there. So I will not really discuss the new thing he has found with this, uh, I think, very, very interesting uh, experiment. But more uh, when we observe this, uh, the, the, this uh, concentration field at the pore scale, what, how can we describe them and what can we, uh, how can we quantify this phenomenon of, uh, of mixing? So the fact that the solute here is transported in a porous media. So these grains here, the black grains are porous media as are, por are grains, so solid grains, and uh, this is the fluid. And here we have a solute that is traveling in this uh, medium. And as you see, it's, it's not homogeneous. We have high concentrations at some points, low concentrations at other points, and this is going to influence a, 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 a broad range of processes, uh, including chemical reactions, bacteria, and, um, uh, and also just the concentration, so dilution of the, of the solute. Uh, obviously, there has been a, a, a lot of people involved. I will not have time to uh, cite everybody, but it's a, a lot um, resulting from uh, collective uh, work. Um, so, yeah, the, the first, uh, I wonder why we put a, a few slides of motivation why mixing is important. Maybe uh, some of you know it are, uh, already. Uh, and the first thing, obviously, is uh, to, uh, when we deal with contaminant transport and remediation. So this is a well-known uh, pollution uh, accident. Um, that, that's chromium pollution of groundwater coming from uh, this uh, company, it's elect electrical, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. This is in uh, California. And this was a famous uh, case of uh, um, uh, contamination and one, one of one cases that went to trial with uh, which was described in this in this movie here uh, where it was not clear at the beginning who was responsible for uh, all the disease or the cancer that was observed in this little village and then it has to be, he had to be proven that it was actually a, a, a consequence of transport of contaminant from this uh, um, this uh, industry here and that that's what is uh, discussed in this movie and you see, the, it's only recently that this was resolved and that the, this company had to pay $300 million in damage to the victims and $700 million uh, for cleaning this, this, uh, this site. So here we have the first problem that is mixing is actually to know what is the concentration here of contaminant that is going to be uh, in the, the water used by this village. So if we want to know how we go from a high concentration here to a lower concentration here and how fast we go to this low concentration or what is the risk, the probability to exceed a given threshold of concentration that's really a question about mixing. So how this solute is mixing with the, uh, current, the, the groundwater to dilute. Uh, so that's the first thing and the second mixing problem here is that if we want to remediate that plume, uh, there, are, there are different options. Uh, one of them is to inject something that reacts with this chromium and maybe makes it precipitate and then fix it on the ground, which uh, is a solution to, to clean the groundwater. And when we do this, we need to inject uh, something and make sure it mixes well with the contaminant. And that's another mixing problem. So how do we design this? How can we predict this? Um, there is another, even more recent, contamination uh, uh, event that you know all very well, that's in Fuk Fukushima. And these are uh, concentrations of radio radionucleate measured in 2012 in the area of Fukushima here. So you, you have uh, a very strong contamination, but it's not homogeneous. So it's another, another mixing problem. How, uh, how can we know and try to predict how this uh, concentration uh, field here is evolving and uh, how, how, what is the probability for this to, to go be, be below the threshold that are acceptable. And another here um, transport problem is here in the ocean. So this, this is a map of concentration of cesium-134 uh, in the oceans. Uh, so we, where we see that uh, what is leaking here from the aquifer to 
the ocean is now is then transported to the, uh, to the ocean over quite run, long distances. And or, again, knowing what is the concentration here of uh, this solute in the ocean as it gets transported in this turbulent field is uh, also another mix mixing problem. This is in March 2011. This is one snapshot. One snapshot. One snapshot, yeah. So this suggests that the puff was released uh, at different Yes, that or maybe that there was some change in the currents uh, that created this uh, intermittent field. Uh, yeah. Tides maybe? Okay, so um, now, this, this work for contaminant transport, we have also uh, natural systems where mixing it plays an important role uh, when we want to understand uh, uh, the cycle of elements in uh, the earth. So one of the key issues is to know, understand how river transport and recycle uh, nutrients and, 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 di and different chemical species. Uh, and uh, uh, to understand this, there has been a lot of work recently, in the last maybe uh, uh, 10 years, even more than before, uh, about hi the hyperic zone, because this is uh, su suspected to be a reactor for the river. So because it has a porous media here and there is a continuous exchange between the river and the sediment. Uh, and this uh, here in this porous, so in the sediments, you can have uh, reactive surfaces, you can have uh, um, a bacteria that attach to the surfaces and you also have opportunity for groundwater and surface water to mix and react. Uh, so denitrification, uh, all kinds of redox processes. So it, 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 this has been the focus of a lot of research. And one of the key things here is to understand um, what is the role of mixing of different what kind of water. So here river water and groundwater on uh, the reaction that take place here. Uh, going back to uh, now industrial systems, so one, one uh, example where mixing is actually a problem is um, uh, geothermal systems, so where, where we, there is uh, typically we inject, um, we pump uh, hot water from the subsurface, we extract the heat and then we, we inject it back. And when we do this, uh, we can mix uh, different types of water that was not supposed to mix initially, but when we pump them, it creates a disequilibrium and mixes, for instance, uh, oxygen-rich water coming from this nearby river with um, iron-rich groundwater coming from uh, deeper. And then this precipitates in, uh, in, the, in, the inject in the pumping borehole and in all the loop of, of ge in the geothermal loop, as you see here, where you have these uh, big biofilms that develop with a lot of iron precipitation in, in, inside, and these are the kind of uh, uh, bacteria that, that, that live in this environment. Uh, this is a, 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 a case that we have studied in this PhD thesis, uh, with a few uh, interesting examples actually in Paris, so where we had this uh, 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 geothermal uh, dipole used to cool down the, the buildings in Paris, because they are um, a classified building and they cannot have air conditioning on their walls, so they use a lot of geothermal energy. And some cases, in some cases, they were actually pumping water from the Seine, the, the river in Paris, uh, creating this, this kind of dis disruptions. So that's uh, all, uh, an example also of uh, mixing driven reactions where we need to, to know about mixing. Uh, l l last case is also well known. Uh, an, an application is CO2 injection, and this is uh, where we inject uh, uh, CO2 in the subsurface and uh, the CO2, the mixing of the dissolved CO2 with the uh, uh, resident groundwater can create chemical disequilibrium, uh, like here, uh, and trigger all kinds of chemical reactions. In this case, in this paper, they studied the dissolution of the rock due to this injection of, uh, of CO2. And so how the CO2 here that creates this dense finger, so there are a few posters about this uh, in the subsurface. So the creation of these fingers here uh, um, uh, will control how this CO2 mixes with the groundwater and then ultimately what is the concentration of CO2 that, 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 that can trigger or not chemical reactions. Uh, and, uh, and when we consider this mixing driven reactions, so this, in this case here, in this paper, they, they studied uh, precipitation. 
we see that it's highly sensitive to the concentration of the two reactants that we, we, we put together, we mix. So this, this uh, uh, experiment here is, uh, is done in a helicho cell, so that's a 2D, uh, 2D cell where we in they inject it in the center and then they inject, uh, so they inject a component A that reacts, reacts with the, the, the solute B we, which is inside. And as a function of the relative concentration of our, our, our A and B, they see that they have a, a world range of different uh, uh, precipitation structure that develop uh, for uh, only uh, small changes in concentration. So then this, this shows that uh, it's quite important to understand uh, how the concentration of a solute evolves when it is mixed in, in an environment like that. So, in the, as you know now very well, and there has been several talks, in the subsurface we can consider two scales, uh, the pore scale and the Darcy scale where we define the permeability. And at these two scales there are uh, uh, important open questions remaining about mixing. So how, what, is it, was the, what is the impact of this heterogeneity or this, the, 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 the heterogeneity at Darcy scale, so the fact that the permeability is varying over orders of magnitude. What is the impact of this heterogeneity on mixing and how can we produce, pr pr predict mixing in these systems? I will focus more on the pore scale uh, to explain in this lecture um, the basic uh, phenomenon. I thought it was easier. Uh, if I have time in the end, I will say a few words about the Darcy scale mixing. And so I wanted to start with actually experiments that students that you are doing here. Uh, and this is a column experiment done in uh, just the, the um, building over there by the, the one group. Uh, I put my beer as a scale here, but <laughs> 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 that was at the poster session yesterday. And what they have done is um, to pack uh, gel beads here in this column. So you're welcome to have a look afterward. It's quite, quite interesting. Uh, these gel beads here that uh, absorb water and basically they have almost, they, they are 90% water and uh, when you have them inside the, the water, you, 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 they become transparent. So that's really nice because uh, then if we inject a, a transparent uh, a, a fluorescent dye and we uh, light it with the right wavelengths, uh, we, we can image the distribution of concentration in these kind of columns. Uh, they, you have started to, to do it already, I think? The injection is tomorrow. Injection is tomorrow, so <laughs> that's actually from Rennes. We did uh, something. <laughs> okay. Uh, another experiment that is related to, to what I'm going to talk about is the 2D experiment that the other group is doing in millifluidics. So that's now a 2D cell with some cylindrical obstacle. And then uh, what the group is doing is injecting a solute dye, a fluorescent dye. This is uh, illuminated, illuminated from below by, uh, again, the right, right wavelengths. And with this, the, uh, Joaquin gave me the, gave me the, the first um, video that they obtained. You have this, uh, can observe nicely this mixing phenomena here. So they inject a dye and you can see how it uh, mixes with the, the resident water. And you have the creation of these uh, fingers here due to heterogeneity that we uh, study a lot because they, they play a, 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 a obviously a very important role for mixing. So you see it's not a straight front, it's not a diffusive front, so there is, there is a lot of structure in it. Uh, this is actually a not very well resolved image for the video, but it's actually much better when you look on the screen that they have here and you see this very well developed uh, lamellar pattern, which I will discuss uh, in detail. So, but for this talk, I will use the results of Yoris, the experiment uh, that he's showing in his poster over there, uh, which is similar, quite very similar to the column experiment that the group is doing. It's a bit better resolved in terms of optical properties because he is, has worked a lot on the index matching. So these are actually glass beads, not, not gels, not uh, gel beads. And uh, so the similar experiment was done also in Marseille by the group uh, who is also here. Um, and so the, the, the experiment here consists in injecting continuously a, a fluorescent dye. So these are three different injections. Uh, the dye is injected from top to the bottom and this is injected continuously until we reach a steady state. So then we have a steady state concentration field. Nothing is moving anymore and we can uh, uh, look at, so really scan it 
from top to bottom um, in, in, in the whole detail because it is, a, it is stationary, so it's, it's not changing in time. And so we are going to look at a perpendicular plane here. So we have a laser sheet here that goes uh, perpendicular to the flow direction. And we are going to look at how uh, this plume here mixes with the, the resident water as a function of the distance from the injection. So the, 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 the plane here is moving and the, the system is static. Well, this looks like this. So now you see, I hope you see the, the grains here. It seems that they are moving, but in fact they are static. It's us that are moving with our laser sheet through the medium. And so, as you see, you, you, you start, we started with a point injection somewhere here. And after only a few grains, uh, the, the, this, this uh, solute here has become highly stretched. Uh, we have uh, so some areas that remain relatively highly concentrated and others that are uh, already quite dilute. So we, when we did this experiment, we, did, we actually wanted to minimize diffusion because that was uh, the objective was to just to measure the length of this thing. So try to minimize diffusion as much as possible. Uh, so it was a highly viscous fluid. Uh, but here, I mean, still there, there is a little bit of diffusion over the time scale. One, also, one aspect also is that maybe we are a little bit below the resolution here. So what looks like dilution is actually uh, um, the fact that it's, uh, um, uh, the resolution scale is maybe bigger than the solid scale. So, I yeah. Um, I don't think so, no, Joris? No. So that's the, yeah, this one is almost the same concentration as initially. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to show you a little no, another example, so you see we start with this blob is uh, compared to the grain is uh, you know maybe um, one fifth of the grain or so, and then as we go again that's another injection, and we go we scan the plume right so everything is static we we, we are moving here with the flow we see that this, this plume here is again stretched. So it's not the same pattern always. So there is a kind of variability. And we, we have this uh, highly stretched uh, lamella pattern that develop here. Uh, and some of the solute is still concentrated while all other parts are much more dilute. Uh, so really I want to use this uh, uh, experiment here to discuss what we know about mixing and um, all what uh, Yoris has discovered about chaotic mixing and so on, he will be, I think, happy to explain in his poster. So for this, I will use the very nice experiment done in Marseille uh, by the uh, Bleu Nesger and Henri Lucier, who are here. Um, and that's an even simpler system. So, and I think it's very nice. It's quite an academic um, uh, experiment. Uh, but it's uh, perhaps the first time that the full theory of mixing was uh, really verified until the, the, the end on, the, on such a simple system. So what they have done is look at uh, a, a die, so that's a, a, um, a line of tracer. It's actually an, an inverse of the tracer, if I'm right. What they have done is, uh, is they have uh, filled this tank here with fluorescine, and then they have bleached the fluorescine here. Uh, to create a line of anti-tracer. So actually what we are measuring is the, the lack of tracer. But we can always uh, normalize the concentration to get back a tracer here. What is nice is that it's a really uh, a super well-defined uh, line here that we have in this, uh, in this uh, system. And then we are going to look how this line is evolving in a shear flow. So that's a system that they have developed here where we have a, sim a sim very simple and well-defined shear flow that is going to uh, stretch on this line, which is the then going to mix in with the environment. So that's the video that Blun gave me yesterday. And you see this uh, line of tracer here is going to, is sheared by the velocity gradient, and it mixes with the, with the, the resident water. So here we have the basic, uh, basically all the ingredients to understand what we see in the more complex porous media where we have blobs that are sheared at different um, strengths. Here we consider one shear rate and we look at how uh, it influences the mixing, so the concentration, 
So we, 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 we are going to be interested in both the concentration here and what is the width here, which we want to know for the prose media. Okay? So I can just play it again if you want. So we shear the line of tracer and then it expands here at some point and dilutes with the environment. Uh, so what the, the, they have measured here very carefully is what is this width here of this line, which in, this is shown here for different uh, shear rates, which are defined by this Peclet number. And what you see is that uh, the, so this, this is the width of the, of the um, tracer line here as a function of time for different velocity here. So shear velocity, this is the strongest shear and this is the smallest shear and this would be no shear. So then it would just expand by diffusion, square root of dt. Uh, and what we see is that the main effect of the shear is actually to compress the, the width of this um, um, tracer line. So why, why is it compressing? Like, can I have the, the light? So we have here uh, an object here that is sheared. And because it's an incompressible fluid, the width here times the length is a constant. So S times the length is a constant. And L is increasing by shear. So then the, the, the width has to decrease because that's an incompressible fluid. So we have S is just one over the length. And so what is the length of this uh, sheared uh, um, uh, line here? It's just simply we apply Pythagore. So this is here, this is a constant. So we're going to normalize it to one. And this is gradient of velocity times time. And so the length here squared, this length squared is this squared plus this. So the length here is square root of 1 plus grad v squared t squared. So this is for a uh, large time, this is going more or less like grad v t. And so this length here is decreasing more or less linearly. So there is the S0 here would be the initial width. OK? Uh, and we have, from this, we can also define a characteristic shear time, which is the time at which this term here becomes large compared to 1. Before that, there is not much effect of shear, because this would be small compared to 1, and the length is constant. And so the shear time here would be, is just when this is equal to 1, so it starts to be equal to 1, so it's when t is 1 over grad v. So it's 1 over grad v. This is the, the, the characteristic time of the shear here. OK, so we understand from this simple uh, concept why the, the width here is decreasing. So compression here. And this is important because it's going to enhance the concentration gradient. So as you reduce the width you have this, and you keep the same concentration, you increase the concentration gradient over here. And then th with that, you also increase the mixing rate. Uh, and we see that uh, as we shear less and less, we have less and less compression. So that that's makes sense. So to understand this full evolution, we actually need to uh, not only understand the compression regime, but also what happens here, where it seems that the width is becomes constant, and then at the at, at the at the, the the second regime where it increases again. So we need to understand two, the balance between two, two phenomena, this compression here. Uh, this is just what I've written over there. Uh, the, the width here by compression is decreasing linearly in time and diffusion here, which increases everything like square root of dt. Initially, this one is stronger than diffusion and it compresses, but at some point there is an equilibrium between these two terms. Uh, that uh, leads to, to a, uh, um, a time here where the scale cannot decrease anymore and any smaller. We have a balance between the two. So how do we find that, that scale here? It's a, a famous scale called after Bachelor, so uh, one um, uh, fluid mechanics uh, scientist. 
that define the scale at which compression equi equilibrates with diffusion. And here it's going to be simple. We're just going to equate these two terms. So when uh, the, the width, the, the decrease due to compression is actually equal to square root of dt. So if I can have the uh, equating these two terms, we, we write. So S0 over grad vt is square root of dt. OK? And then, then from this, I can get the time at which this happened. So I just put everything on the same side. So then I have square root of t. Yeah, but I don't care for this. Uh, square root of t times t on one side. And then on the other side, I have S0 over grad v uh, square, uh, square root of t, square root of d. So then I raise everything to the power of 2. So I have t to the 3 is equal to S0 over grad v squared, S0 squared times d. So then the mixing time, which is this time here at equilibrium, is equal to S0 squared over grad v squared d to the one third. So that's a simple reasoning that I can do to understand what is going on here and why this is coming to, uh, this is happening here at this time. Why don't you care about the two? I can, I can put the two, but that's, uh, let's put the two. Is, is, here we are, we are just, uh, it's an order of magnitude estimate. It's, it's not really, we, we are not looking at detail of the factor. We want more to know how it depends on diffusion on, and on velocity than the exact prefactor. So from this, we get, uh, so, sorry, just one second. So we, we have here the time. So I'm going to call it TB, T, the bachelor for bachelor, right? Uh, and if I want to know now what is the scale here at which this happened, this scale here, the bachelor scale, I just uh, take this time and include it here in this first regime. So I want to know what is the value of this scale here when T is equal to this time. So it's actually S0 grad V over T. And so this is SB is S0 grad V over TB. And so when I replace this here, I just get S0 over grad V and this to the minus one third. All right, so that's quite simple here. And I have uh, summarized it here. So we have um, to find this uh, mixing time and the bachelor scale. We equate the, the decrease phase and the increase phase here like this. We get um, the, 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 the mixing time that we can actually express as a function of the Peclé number that I will define. Um, and then from this, we get the mixing time and the, the, the mixing scale. So that's the min, min, minimum scale at which we can compress where it balances, where compression balances with diffusion. Now let me define this Peclé number here. So the Peclé number here is a ratio between a diffusive diffusion time and a shear time. So the shear time is here, I'm going to call it T gamma. A shear time is one over grad V, so it's when the shear becomes active. And the diffusion time is just S0 squared over D, so that's the time to diffuse over the initial scale. Right, so this is now S0 squared over D divided by one over grad V. So it's S0 grad V over D, which is what I, I have here. So we can express everything as a function of Peclet number that compare the strength of the shear to the diffusion, to the diffusion coefficient, basically. All right, so this uh, team from Marseille, because they are very careful and they want to check everything experimentally, they have 
uh, varied the Peclet number here for this experiment. And they have indeed verified that this, the bachelor scale here scales like the Peclet number to the one third, uh, like as predicted by this simple, uh, this simple concept here. So, but what about the porous media? Yeah. yeah. The plume becomes single. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I think because that was for a blob injection, so that was not for. That's not actually not the right image, but it was uh, easier to show. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what happens now for a porous media? Can we use this? Is it the same that is happening? That you know it can explain what what is the length of these filaments? So how do we know what is the the bachelor scale for our porous media? There is no, actual, for, for the moment, there is not formally defined bachelor scale for pose media. There is one for turbulence and the ocean is quite well known. But can we, should we define the bachelor, bachelor scale for pose media? Um, now in terms of uh, deformation, fluid deformation, what we have found, and that, that was only recently, um, and Joris would explain this in detail in his poster, is that it's a quite different from a simple shear, especially in 3D. So in 2D, it looks like a simple shear. The deformation of uh, what you will observe in your 2D experiment will be more or less linear in time. Uh, but in 3D, uh, there is a, a possibility for chaotic mixing. And I want to illustrate this from these simulations here. So this is the same type of uh, idea we are here Looking at this porous media, that's, the, that's a periodic porous media. We flow through this porous media and then we look at different distances in a plane perpendicular to the main flow. It's the same thing that we look experimentally. And then what you see is that uh, here you see uh, um, elements of fluids that were initially all very small like this one that become elongated uh, very strongly by the flow here in a kind of chaotic mixing process where we have this uh, stretching and folding event that happen all along the, the trajectory. And this is, uh, and you, you can see at the end, you have a huge stretching even after a few grains only. It's also interesting to note that some of the initial fluid elements have not been stretched at all. They have ex ex managed to ex escape somehow uh, the places that were stretching so strongly like this one. So we, we see that we have, first observation is that it's not stretching like in a shear flow. This is stretching like in a chaotic mixer. And it means that instead of increasing linearly, these uh, lengths would increase exponentially. And that's an important difference for these models. And the second observation is that you have a broad distribution of stretching. So some of them are highly stretched and others have managed to escape the, the big stretching places. This is pure advection, yeah. yeah. Because we want to understand stretching, we look at pure advection. Uh, <coughs> so this explains what we see is actually very similar. I'm going to skip that one, that's another. It's very similar from what Joris is observing experimentally. Uh, you, you, you see this stretching and folding phenomenon. Uh, and so I'm going to, uh, to, ex to explain how we can deal with this. I'm going to quantify this with a simple stretching, chaotic stretching protocol here, uh, where we say that every, every grain, we double the length of a filament that is undergoing this chaotic, chaotic mixing protocol. So at each grain, I'm going to assume that the length of the filament is multiplied by two. It's actually not true, and, and Joris can explain in, in more details that uh, there, are, there is a factor here, it's not exactly two and why and so on, but for, just for this, uh, purpose of this lecture, I would assume is a factor of two. And so when we do that, we can uh, imagine that after one di grain diameter, the size of a filament is doubled. After two, two diameter is multiplied by four, after three diameter is multiplied by eight, and so on. So it's two to the power of n. And this is exponential of log two times n. So you, you can see that after n power, we, the, the length increases exponentially. Uh, this is why a chaotic mixing is very different from the shear flow that I showed here. It's much st uh, stretching much more. And then if we say that 
this number here of pore is just the distance where we are divided by the size of the grain. Okay, so then we have a function. So uh, uh, we we have the um, uh, length of the filament as a function of the position, where this exponent here is log two over d, and this this, this exponent here is called the Lyapunov exponent. And that quantified the, the strength of the, of, the, of the stretching for a chaotic mixing protocol, chaotic steering protocol, actually. So log 2 over d. So that's... Now we, I'm going to use this to try to estimate the bachelor scale for this porous media, like we did for the shear flow. So here it's quite simple. What we do here is that we have an exponential uh, elongation. So that's the length of the, the filament divided by the initial length that grows exponentially. Now I'm expressing this in time, but it's really just multiplying by the velocity. And so, so the Lyapunov exponent in time is the Lyapunov exponent in space uh, multiplied by the velocity. And so the, sorry, the, the elongation rate is constant here. It's uh, equal to the Lyapunov exponent. And the compression rate is also constant. So the co because of volume conservation, the compression rate is minus the elongation rate. So we have a constant compression rate that needs to balance at some point with the expansion rate here that is uh, the, the result of diffusion. So this expansion rate, when I take this square root of dt expansion, I take the derivative, I divide by 1 over s, uh, that's what you get, you can verify. So the, the expansion rate due to diffusion is d times the, the, the diffusion length. So this means that for very small lengths of diffusion, the expansion is very strong. And when we have big lengths of diffusion, it's smaller and smaller. So when we equate these two terms here, compression and diffusion, we, 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 we find simply that um, at the bachelor scale, we have uh, the stretching rate is equal to diffusion coefficient divided by the bachelor scale to the square. So the bachelor scale is just the square root of diffusion coefficient divided by um, uh, the stretching rate here, which we estimated uh, from the, the reasoning to be equal to log 2 times the velocity divided by the, the diameter. So that's uh, something actually, I don't know if that could be verified during the summer school from your setup, but that uh, has not been, been really verified so far. And we'll see, I'm not sure that if it would work, but that would be uh, interesting to verify. In the, in the case of uh, turbulent flow, it's quite well known. Um, yes? Yes. The bachelor scale here is the scale at which you equilibrate compression and diffusion. So compression reduces the size of the plume and diffusion expands it. So when we equate these two, we, get, we go the bachelor scale. What is interesting also here is that um, when, when we, have, we are looking at the chaotic steering protocol, we arrive to a bachelor scale and then instead of increasing again, like for shear flow, it's, it remains constant. So because the stretching is very strong here, is exponential, um, this compression is also very strong. And then it's, it fixes the, the bachelor scale. The scale of the lamellas are then set to the bachelor scale. They cannot expand anymore afterwards. So that's a very big difference between this kind of steering protocol and just a linear shear. In linear shear at some point, the diffusion overcomes the compression because it's only linear in time. But wait a minute. But here it would mean that the lamina tend to coalesce because uh, of diffusion. No, I, 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 and the opposite. So by diffusion alone, they would not coalesce because they, are, they don't grow. The width is, is, is constant. They would still coalesce, but because they, they get closer and closer by uh, stretching and compression. And that's, uh, yeah. So the Reynolds are very small. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, Stokes flow. So, so if you do this, let's say, with realistic coefficients, you get the feeling. Yeah, well, that's what I want to do <laughs> as an exercise now. So let's take uh, what you have in your column, John. Uh, 1.47 million. Oh, actually, I will go to 
here where I have. So this, this is square root of d over the stretching rate. And the stretching rate, I naively estimate it like this. There is actually a, a, a little fraction here on, on in front that Joris can tell you. But this is, let's say, not too bad of, uh, order of magnitude. So we have d over log 2 v over d. Can you calculate what it would be? D over log 2. Okay. So V is 10 centimeters an hour. Uh, so v, is, v is 10 centimeters per hour. per hour. D is 1 centimeter. Yeah. 1 centimeter. And capital D is 10 to minus 10. So log 2 is about 0 0.6, right? And d would be 10 to the minus 9? 10 to the minus 10. 9. 10 to the minus 10? So can someone calculate this? That is, is meter, meters per sec, meter squared per second, right? Uh, so v over d would be <laughs> 10 to the minus 3. OK. Oops. So that's 10 to the minus 3. 0 0.6, and v over d would be uh, 10, right? So that's more or less 10 to the minus 2 centimeters. No, 10 to the minus 1. Sorry, 10 to the minus 2. 10 to the minus 2. If I ignore this, so that's uh, square root of 10 to the minus 4. It's 10 to the minus 2 centimeters, more or less. And you have centimeter scale beads, right? So this, this, this scale would be one hundredth of the beads. It's quite small. Yeah. Well, but if you, if you do this now with, let's say, more realistic round order beads, yeah. so then you would have a, a diameter, let's say, of a millimeter. Right. So this would be a sand, a coarse sand, and you would have a velocity of 10 to the power of minus uh, 5 meters per second, yeah. one meter per day. Yeah. This, um, I, I've done the calcul. I can show it on the here. I've done for more realistic things, but this is, this is very coarse and very quick. No, no, obviously, obviously, you're right. Uh, so here I have done this for um, three different velocities, so around one meter per day, and I've taken different diameter of of the grains, uh, going from kind of ten, uh, micrometer to uh, centimeter. So that, that's what we are just made, the calculus we have just made. You see that we are very small. Uh, the scale is very small. Uh, so and these are for three more or less realistic velocities. Or what we see is that this is the bachelor scale normalized by the grain diameter. So this here is when it is equal to the grain diameter. OK, so. For, let's say if we take one meter per day, we see that uh, only for a grain size l smaller than 10 to the minus 4 meter, so 0 0.1 millimeter, 100 micrometers, we, we, uh, we are fully mixed at the pore scale. It, it, it's, it's, a bit, it's a little bit uh, <laughs> preoccupying, but... <laughs> Uh, then I will, I will show, if I have time, that there is another process that Jesus mentioned that is coalescence that actually balances this, this effect a little bit. But it's still um, a question, I think. So what we see here is that we have defined the scale of this object here, this uh, lamella here, that are seen in this experiment. And we, from this um, 
uh, estimate that we have done. We estimate that they should be of this size here, of this, uh, the size of the bachelor scale, and then remain like this. Uh, however, at some point, as you can see here, they become so close to each other that they, they can actually merge and form larger uh, lamellas, which, are, uh, which, which corresponds to the sum of the elementary lamellas that have aggregated. Well, we will see this in, in, a, in a minute. What we have done also, you can express this as a function of the Peclet number. So we can see from this estimate, you can make the calculus that for there is a threshold Peclet number of five, and above this Peclet number, you would be always incompletely mixed. And below this, this Peclet number, you would be uh, fully mixed. So that's another way to, to look at it. Um, I'm one minute, OK. <laughs> the, the, uh, so, so it means that for all these range, the dispersion coefficient does not represent what is actually mixing, uh, because it's much larger than the, the mixing scale. We have seen can be up to 100 times larger and so on. But for a small Peclet number, then the dispersion coefficient is probably a good measure of the mixing. Uh, just to finish, because I'm out of time, uh, I wanted to, to show quickly what happens with coalescence. So here again, I'll just show you because uh, guys from Marseille, they want to verify everything. They have also looked at two lamellas close to each other and how they merge. And you can see here the stretching. They go closer and closer to each other, and then at the end, it's just one lamella. Okay. And so what is the consequence of this uh, on uh, the, the, the mixing scale, the bachelor scale? What uh, Emmanuel uh, Villermo and, and his colleague have uh, shown is that when you coalesce this, this lamella like this, there is, there is a resulting scale that is called a coarse graining scale, coarse grain scale, that is just n times the bachelor scale, well, n is the number of lamella that have added together. So it's relatively simple. And what uh, in, this, in this case, and I think Emmanuel will show this in his talk after, is that the number of lamella, because this is exponentially stretching, is the number of lamella is also growing exponentially. Uh, that's to, because you have constraints on the mean concentration, you need to have this. And so if you look at the resulting scale, it's the bachelor scale times an exponential function. So we expect it to actually uh, grow very fast at some point. And that, at this point, is just an, a, a hypothesis. But uh, that's what we, a uh, few weeks ago, we, 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 we discussed with Joris. P p that could happen, so we would have uh, an initial regime of compression. If you would not have this uh, coalescence, you would just be stuck at the bachelor scale forever. But with, uh, with this aggregation and this exponential number of aggregation, we, we could uh, imagine that the scale of mixing is then after uh, increasing exponentially, so very fast, to reach uh, easily the dispersion scale. And then after this, so we could imagine that all the concept of dispersion that we, ha we, we have discussed this morning would be applicable because then we would be fully mixed until the dispersion scale. I think that's uh, still very hypothetical and we have to, to verify this. Uh, <laughs> exactly. That's a, a scenario you could imagine. But what is interesting in this scenario is that compared to what you would have, you know, if you just consider a diffusion, no, no compression, you would have an in initial uh, stage where you, the stretching is actually uh, promoting incomplete mixing, so smaller structures. Uh, but at some point, it's actually promoting the, the, the creation of uh, homogeneous areas. And so you have uh, these two effects here that are creating by, by this, created by this phenomenon. All right, that was, I think I'm going to stop here. There was, uh, I wanted to talk about concentration, what is the, uh, consequence of this on concentration, but uh, yeah, maybe if some, some of you are interested, we could uh, have a look together, maybe around the column experiment over there. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't put them here, but well, you can see maybe here. 
uh, here. So th these, these are, you, you can measure actually all the, the, the things that are classical in chaos, including these Poincaré maps that show, so this is for the simulation that show, you can see the chaotic uh, regions and at some, some places you have non-chaotic islands. Uh, this is really linked to the fact that this is a periodic pore. So you would not necessarily have so, such well-defined structures in uh, random porous media. And then you can explain the um, uh, strengths of mixing, so the, the, of, of steering, uh, by looking at uh, manifolds that are... Uh, so when you go around the grain, when you go around, the flow goes around the grain, here it has to diverge and then compress after the grain. And so you, have, you can define what is called an unstable manifold that repels, oh sorry, a stable manifold here that repels all the particle from, from it, and an unstable manifold that attracts exponentially the particle after the grain. And so you have two manifolds here and that are created by all the, the beads. And one way to understand the chaos is to see when these manifolds intersect with some angle. And we, we have done the, all this analysis. I, I can explain more if you, need, if you want. Uh, yeah. It's a good question. We, we, let's see. Yeah, for example, here. So it depends what you look at. So if you look at, for example, mixing of this solute with this solute, and that creates precipitation. So the precipitation would occur along the interface between the two solutes. And so, so the shape of the front would follow the, the shape of the interface in the, between the solutes. And so then it becomes really important to know what is this length, because that will be the, the main factor controlling the total mass of precipitate. Yeah, 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 but in 3D is tricky. So there are a lot of data in 2D, and in 2D you cannot have this phenomenon. Uh, in 2D everything is dominated by shear. Uh, yeah, micro, maybe we can ha ask Martin Blunt and Branko <laughs> to, to look at this. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would need to know when these two solutes are together and in addition close to a surface to know where it would precipitate. Sorry? Ah, we can look at other reactions that... that homogeneous reactions. Homogeneous reactions, yeah. So redox, there are many kinds of redox reactions that occur in the fluids. Yeah. yeah. Okay, do we have another question from students? Yeah. Uh, so here you're assuming that the beads are smooth. Uh, would you think, is this a strong assumption? Maybe if the, I mean, could the ruggedness have an impact on the formation? Yeah, sure. That's a very good question. We, the next uh, step would be to look at this in uh, real rocks, uh, micro CT images, and uh, uh, here I, I, I think that that would have an important effect because um, the way that this is stretching is quite related to the topology of the solid interface when we were talking about the manifolds and so on. It, it's highly dependent on the topology of the surface. I, I still uh, highly suspect that it would still be chaotic, but uh, the, 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 the Lyapunov exponent would be certainly different. Uh, 